Good day brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to my channel. We're going to continue our Bible study in Daniel chapter 7. Um, if I can just may ask if you wouldn't mind subscribing and smashing the like button um, and sharing my videos with as many family members and friends it all helps to get the gospel message of Jesus Christ out to a broken world. So let's just have a look at the Bible now. Daniel chapter 7. Um, and we'll listen to the audio. Then we'll take a look at my notes and break it down from there. Chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, Behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns 
horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume, and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Okay, folks, let's have a look and see and unpack this very interesting chapter 7. And we can see, as we look here, we see that there's the introduction to the vision of the four beasts. Verse 1, In the first year of Balthazar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Okay, this vision of Daniel comes after the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, but before the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Medo Persian Empire. So we need to deduct from chapters 1 to 6 describes the life and times of Daniel. Then in chapter 7 through to chapter 12 describes the visions Daniel had. In order of events, the vision described in Daniel 7 took place during the time between Daniel's chapters 4 and 5. Okay. This is a f the first vision of 4 described between Daniel 7 and 12. This is the most comprehensive vision. The other three visions go into greater detail within the general framework of this first vision. Okay, telling the main facts here, Daniel could have given us more detail, okay, but the Holy Spirit only wanted him to write the main facts. We may wish also that Daniel went into greater detail, but unfortunately he didn't, and that is God's sovereign um, hold over revelation. He can hold back whatever he wants and give whatever he wants. Okay, so now we need to look at verse 2 and 3. Four beasts and where they came from. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from one another. Stirring up the great sea, this was most certainly the Mediterranean Sea, as each of the empires mentioned in this region had a geographical connection to the Mediterranean Sea. The idea here of stirring up is of chaos and tumult. Um, to a Hebrew, the sea both was dangerous and mysterious. It had a restless element, okay, 
but not beyond our Lord's power to tame it. That's what Bullmond quoted. Okay. And also we need to be reminded that the term sea sometimes used as a picture of a Gentile nation. And there's the reference in Psalm 74, 89, and Isaiah 57. And the four winds of heaven, but some of these winds, okay, are described by some scholars as a description of the sovereign power of God striving over man, as in Psalm 35, 48, 107, Isaiah 27, and Isaiah 41. However, Strauss suggests that the four winds were satanic forces, as mentioned in Revelation 7.1. And then we need to have a look at these four great beasts that come out of the sea. Daniel describes them as ferocious animals engaged that, or oh, sorry, emerges from the great sea, each one distinct from the other. And let's read from 4 to 6 the description of the first three beasts. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise! <coughs> Devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings like a bird. And <clears throat> the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So let's have a look at this first beast was more majestic than any of the following beasts. Lions and eagles are kings in their own realms. So in the animal kingdom, okay, it's making a reference to that, but this majestic beast was humbled because its wings were plucked off and made human. As it says there, a man's heart was given to it. So let's have a look. If we just look a little bit further down to Daniel 17, tells us that these four beasts are the four kingdoms ruling over the earth. The first kingdom is the Babylonian Empire, represented by a lion and an eagle. It fits well with the majestic, with the majesty and the authority of Nebuchadnezzar's rule over the empire of Babylon. So let's just have a look. I've got a picture here. Okay. The world powers of Daniel's prophecy. And remember in Daniel chapter 2, we saw that Nebuchadnezzar's vision was the same. Okay. And here we have the four beasts that come out of the sea in Daniel 7. 
thing. And it goes down to the ruling kingdoms of the world. So we've got the Babylonian kingdom, which is represented by, in Daniel 2, the golden head. But in ja Daniel chapter 7, it's a vicious beast, lion, mixed, or in and an eagle. And then the media Persian um, Empire in Daniel chapter 2 in Nebuchadnezzar's vision that represented silver. But in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, which we end now, was represented by a bear raised up on one side with ribs in its mouth. And then the Greece or the Greek Empire, yeah, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it was represented by the bronze torso and abdomen of the vision. Okay. But in Daniel's dream, it was represented by a leopard okay, with four heads and wings. And then that's the first three. And then later on, as we go into chapter seven, we'll see the fourth beast. Um, which represents the bronze legs of the statue, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. And this beast has got the ten horns with the small horn coming out of it in Daniel's vision that we're going to go and have a look at. So let's have a look at my notes again. Let's carry on here. Okay. So, the first kingdom is the Babylonian Empire, represented by a lion and a king. Okay. Right. So, then the second, like a bear, the second beast didn't have the majestic bearing of either, an, of either a lion or an eagle. Okay. A bear is much slower, but stronger and more crushing than a lion. And this bear had a voracious appetite of conquest and it aroused and devoured much flesh, okay, which coincides with the Medio Persian Empire. They had a voracious appetite for conquest. The bear represents the Medo Persian Empire, succeeding the Babylonian Empire. Okay. And there is a partnership between the Medes and the Persians. Okay. The Persians, however, dominated this relationship. Okay. Now, <clears throat> a lot of scholars think that the three ribs that are in the bear's mouth represent the three great military conquests that the Medes and Persians had in their reign. That was the first one was against Babylon, the second against Egypt, and then the third one is against Libya. So now we also need to have a look at my second footnote here. The slow crushing armies of the Medo Persian Empire. Okay, history attests to how they went again about, sorry, about their campaigns. 
They simply overwhelm their opponents with superior sizes and strength. Okay. The media Persians are compared compared to the bear on this account for their cruelty and thirst after blood. Just as a bear is the most vicious of the wild animals, as Clark um, quotes, there's nothing much or nowhere you could actually escape from a bear. It can climb a tree, it can swim across rivers, and it can run pretty fast. And it's as ferocious as they come. And then, also in the third note, I picked up a quote by Ironside, and the command to arise and devour much flesh indicates that extreme cruelties often practiced by the Persians and the wild extent of their conquests. Okay, so now here's another take on this. The liberal commentators have a vested interest here okay, when they come to this particular description in identifying the bear with only the median state and not a combined empire with the Persian Empire. And they say this because they assign the third beast to the Persian Empire and the fourth to Alexander the Great's Empire. Okay. So as to remove okay, the second one. Okay. So unfortunately if you do that, you remove any elements of predictive prophecy. prophecy. Okay, when you look at look at it through the liberal commentator's point of view, their analyst does not fit. There are many good reasons why the second kingdom could own could not. But it could not be exclusively the medium, um, medium Persian Empire. Their kingdom did not follow the Babylonian historical sequence, but was contemporary with it. Okay. Even rising to strength before the Neo Babylonian period, okay, the median. Empire also never had a world position ranking with the Persians. Okay. And then the motivation for this interpretation is solely to remove the reference to Rome and to divinely remove predictive prophecy. So then we move on to the third beast, which is like a leopard. The leopard was known for its is known for its sudden and unexpected attacks. This was especially swift, with four wings, and clever, having four heads. So Strasia says a quote by him, each animal is mighty but dominates its prey in different ways. Okay, so the lion devours, the bear crushes, and then the leopard springs upon its prey. So now we need to have a look at what Clark 
says about the Greek Empire. It's amazing how, right, before the age of 28, okay, Alexander the Great had run through all the countries okay, of the known world, right up to the Indian Ocean and the River Ganges. And his campaign to rule the known world that time only took 12 years to subdue part of Europe and Asia. Okay. So the other thing that we need to look at too is that after Alexander the Great's death, the empire that he conquered was divided into four parts, which represents the four heads of the game. And they were governed by his generals that were left to control the empire after he had passed away. And so, let's move down to this last footnote that I've got here. Okay. The Babylonian Empire dominated in Daniel's day. Right. One might have guessed, especially with the reign of Balthasar, okay, that the next empire would be the Media Persian Empire. Right. So, these two first empires Daniel was part of. He was part of the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar, then a brief spell under Balthazar, then when Darius came and conquered Balthazar, like the media Persian um, ruler, Daniel also served under him. So it stands to reason that the details given in the vision of Daniel are accurate to the T. But here's the next thing that we need to look at. How could Daniel know the next world empire would be like a leopard in its rise to prominence? talking about the Greek Empire. And that it would be divided into four parts. Okay. So this shows a plain and simple principle that in prophecy God knows the future and reveals certain details about the future through his prophets. It shows that God lives outside our time domain. He's etern he was eternity past and he lives in eternity future and everything between that is our time. Okay. So, he could see the future as well as the past. He sees the whole parade of human history presented before him. Not just part that is just passing in front of a single event. Okay. The proof of fulfilled prophecy is exceptionally Okay. Persuasive. No wonder Peter says we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. That's in 2 Peter 1 verse 19. Making reference to the prophetic word that is confirmed by the fulfillment of these prophecies. Okay? And he warns us that we need to be on our guard and take heed that this prophecy or the prophecies that are predictive shine into dark places. Okay? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. The morning star is a reference to Christ's return. Okay. So we need to take heed of this predictive prophecy that's in Daniel. The fourth beast, now we move on to the fourth one, and that is this beast at the bottom here, with the ten horns and one little horn, is dreadful, horned beast with one conspicuous horn. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before, before whom Three of the first horns were plucked out by its root. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompously words, pompous words. Okay. The fourth beast was indescribable. In Daniel's vision and uniquely horrific in its power and conquest. It was different to the other beasts as it had ten horns. In the ancient world, horns were expressed were an expression of power and fearsomeness. Okay, so this animal represents that. The fourth beast was so strong, okay, it had ten horns. Okay, so let's just break these three points I'd just like to make and a quote from Archer. Different people picture this in different ways. Some suggest that the ten horns were actually two five-pointed antlers rather than ten separate horns. In the historical fulfillment, the fourth beast represents the Roman Empire, which was the largest and strongest and most unified and enduring of them all. Okay. Right. So we also need to understand that there's an unmistakable correspondence between these horns and the ten toes of the dream image in chapter 2 of Nebuchadnezzar and the mention of an iron, of iron in its teeth, suggests that the legs and toes toes of iron, sorry, were also in the image. Okay, then we also see another little horn, a mouth speaking 
pompous words among the ten horns, three were placed or were replaced by one horn that was conspicuous for its dominance. Okay. Right. Before, from three, for the first horns, were plucked out of, or out by the roots. Okay. So obviously, this single horn, this conspicuous one, went forth and conquered these first three horns. And, okay. It had intelligence, the eyes like the eyes of a man, and it was full of boastful talking. Okay, there, with the reference of speaking pompously. Then, we move on to verse 9 and 10, and we see a reference of the Ancient of Days, and the scene surrounding his throne. The Ancient of Days is God, and this is a vision of his throne. Okay, I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels were burning fire, a fiery steam issued, stream issued, and came forth from before him, a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood, stood before him, the court was seated, and the books were opened. Here we see, okay, that the thrones were established there, okay, right? We need to have a look and see what Revelation 4 says also. When, John, when the Apostle John saw heaven, he also saw thrones, but he also saw those who sat on the thrones. There was 24 elders described in Revelation 4 verse 4. Daniel makes no mention of these elders. Okay, because perhaps we need to remember that the 24 elders represent the church, and the church was not was an unrevealed mystery in the Old Testament. Okay, as we see in Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 7. Okay, so we've got to remember that when the prophets of old looked forward in their prophetic passages, they overlooked the age of grace or the time of the Gentiles. Okay. They looked directly straight into the future. Okay. Right to the Messiah coming and giving them victory. Okay. And the Ancient of Days was seated. The Ancient of Days is obviously God, but there is a debate, okay, as if he is specifically God, the Father, or God the Son. They're not sure. In some scholars' minds, most believe that it is God, the Father, because of the white garments and the white hair stresses the eternal character of God, the Father, which I follow 
and believe. Okay. But in Daniel 17 or chapter 7 verse 13 seems to make a distinction between the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, as we'll see a little later. And this is, supports the idea that the Ancient of Days is God the Father and not God the Son as well. Okay, so we ought not to imagine God in his essence to be like any appearance to his own prophet and other holy fathers, but he put on various appearances according to man's comprehension to whom he wished to give some of the signs of his presence. That's what Calvin said. We'll come back to Calvin and his thoughts on that. His throne was f a fiery flame. Right. We know that this is a brilliant manifestation of God's splendor and the fierce heart of his judgment. There seems to be something like lava that is streaming with fire pouring out from the throne. It was like a river of vast destructive power. And we see that in Isaiah 66, verses 15 and on going on, describes the judgment of God in terms of fire. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots, like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Its wheels a burning fire, many commentators say that in the ancient eastern world royal thrones were often on wheels, okay. yet it is just as likely as they represented or represent the endless activity of God. Okay. A thousand thousands ministered to him, that's describing innumerable company of angels surrounding God's throne. Okay, then 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. This describes humanity standing before God in judgment. Okay. The court was seated and the books were opened. Now in the Bible, it describes several books before God. Okay, and any of these combinations. Okay. Could be could mean in Psalm sixty nine verse twenty eight is the book of the living, and then there's the book of Rem remembrance, Malachi three verse sixteen, and then there's the book of life, as well. And then there's also the Lamb's Book of Life. So we've got to, and there's probably more books that we can find in the Bible. Um, okay. So basically, the image here is that the whole of mankind was before God in judgment, okay, and all the books were opened before God, okay, which correlates to the white throne judgment in Revelation. 
Okay. Right. The conspicuous horn is conquered by the Son of Man. Here in verses 11 and 14, we see the events that are carried out against this beast with the conspicuous horn. And it says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they were, they had their dom dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages could serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so here, this is a great passage describing Transitation from human dominion on earth to the divine dominion of Christ. This happens as the Son of Man comes down and exercises dominion over the earth. Okay, the Son of Man succeeds the reign of the fourth beast. Now, as we know, that is referring to Christ's return, the second coming. The Son of Man is a reference to Christ. Okay. The sound of pompous words which the horn was speaking, here the little horn of the fourth beast again speaks pompous words. And the final human dictator, which we commonly called the Antichrist, will be characterized by his boastful, blasphemous speech, as we see in chapter 13 of Revelation. Okay, so this is a correlating scripture for the future that Daniel is seeing. Because of the distinction between the fourth beast and the horn, some con there's some conjecture that the beast of Revelation 13 is not the Antichrist, but his government or his administration. Okay. If this is so, it is a small distinction. Okay. To a large extent, a man does not represent okay, and personify an entire government or system. When we think of Germany in the 1930s and the 40s, the figure of Hitler as an individual and the Nazi Germany as the state are virtually the same. Okay, so these are just that was just a point that I wanted to make about is that dictators rule with a government administration and ad administration okay and the reign of terror is the same I watched till the beast was slain and the rest of the beasts they had their dominion taken away the fourth beast was destroyed and the others may continue but without dominion of their own when Jesus sets up his kingdom here the empire of the Antichrist will be completely crushed. Okay. But some of the nations will continue into the millennium reign. Okay. 
one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. The little, the title Son of Man was a favorite self designation of Jesus, used more than 80 times in the four gospels. He receives all dominion previously held by the beasts, and his reign will be permanent. Okay. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. The reign of Jesus does not only last a thousand years. It's a permanent uh, reign. However, Jesus will rule over the earth before it is remade. Okay, with Satan bound for a thousand years. Okay, that's a reference in Revelation. The interpretation of the dream here from verse 15 to 16, Daniel's reaction to the vision and a request for understanding. Daniel was grieved he says, in my spirit, within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. What Daniel saw and in more detail than he describes for us, he didn't really understand and was troubled because of his lack of understanding. Yeah, he was grieved in his spirit. Okay. So here's just a reference to our spirit that indeed dwells in our body. Okay. Right. It is true, we need to remember that the spirit is more important than the body. Okay. But the state of the body generally has an effect of the state of the spirit. Don't forget, we are spiritual beings. It goes back to the umbilical cord that was severed, right? When Eve was deceived and Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, before they rebelled, they had the umbilical cord of the Holy Spirit in them and that's why God could commune with them and that they could be in the presence of God but as soon as they rebelled the Holy Spirit or that umbilical spiritual cord to God was cut off and now when we are born again of the Spirit we have the Spirit in our bodies physical bodies and as Paul makes reference to our bodies in the gospel or in, in his epistles. He refers to our bodies as tabernacles. Okay. Or tents. And here Clark also says, the phrase my spirit within my body has the sense of, okay, the body is a sheath or a scabbard. Okay. Right, And also, he makes a point that the human spirit is different from the body. And the second point he wants to make is that it has a proper substance independently of the body, which is only its sheath for a certain time. Okay. And then the third point he makes as well is that the spirit may exit independently of the body okay right 
So, even though we will receive our glorified bodies in heaven, or in our, the day of our redemption, right, we are still spiritual beings. Right. So, in verse 17 to 18, the summary of the vision, the four kings are conquered by God, and the kingdoms are given to the people of God. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings which rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possession of the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay, so here the divine interpretation of this dream shows that the vision covers the same material as Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel 2. Okay, so there's a parallel. Let's have a look at this picture here. Right, so there's a parallel. Okay, here's Nebuchadnezzar's vision and here is Daniel's vision. And there's a parallel between these two. So let's have a look and see what we can deduce from that. Which also describes the rise of four empires which are succeeded by the kingdom of God. Okay. So we need to remember that Daniel's vision, our vision is different. He sees the kingdoms from God's perspective, not from man's perspective. Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, saw the present and future world empires in the form of a stately and noble statue of a man. Okay, that is the worldly opinion of the world. Okay, but here God shows how he regards the kingdoms of this world as voracious and wild beasts who devour and conquer without consequence. So in God's economy, he's looking at these beasts, okay, and the condition of man and what he's doing, okay, he's sinning and he's conquering without consequence or without conscience, okay. But in man's view, Man's thinking that they are tremendously wealthy kingdoms. When man writes his own history, there's often much self-congratulation. And man seems to be on the verge of paradise. When God writes human history, a different version is completely presented. Jesus is the lion of the true tribe of Judah. Revelation 5 verse 5 tells us. Yet he primarily represents himself, not as a voracious animal, but as the lamb of God, a sacrificial lamb of God. Okay, Because a sacrifice had to be made. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom when the day of the fourth beast is over. But once the Antichrist has been and his kingdom has been destroyed, then God's people receive the kingdom. Yet we know the Roman Empire is long gone. Okay. So now it doesn't seem that the saints have received the kingdom as yet. So I've got two points here just to elaborate on this. This is what prompts many to look for either a spiritualization interpretation fulfilled in history, okay, or some kind of restoration of the Roman Empire 
in the last days. One that will literally fulfill the prophecies of the ten horns and the little horn as well. Okay. Right. I'm going to come back to that first first point now now. Okay. The saints will receive the kingdom. God gives them the kingdom at the return of Jesus. They do not gain dominion over all these earthly kingdoms before the return of Jesus Christ. Okay. So here we need to remember that we will not gain dominion or gain rule over this earth as Christians until Jesus Christ returns which is against a popular um, sorry a, against a popular false doctrine of replacement theology which moves into seven is it the seven mountain dominion theology which says that they spiritualize all prophetic future interpretation of scripture their theology is wrong because they believe that if enough Christians are in power in prominent places in the world, the world will become a better place and that will prepare the earth for God's, for Christ's return. We have got no input in the preparation of Christ's return. God has ordained that from the beginning of time and Christ is the only one that ministers and administers the judgment over the Antichrist. And only when He comes and as described in Revelation 19 do the saints receive the kingdom of God okay so here in verse 19 to 22 Daniel specific request to know about the conspicuous horn right then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured and broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Okay. Here, there is much interest in all these four beasts, but Daniel was especially interested in the fourth, most terrible beast, and especially about the conspicuous horn. Right. The fourth beast interested, in, interested Daniel because of its great destructive power because of the conspicuous horn and because 
of its fight against God's people. So we've got to remember that this horn represents the Antichrist and he fights against the saints in the second half of the tribulation period, the three and a half, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period or the Jacob's trouble. It does not necessarily mean that the church will be on earth as a target of the Antichrist during the tribulation. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that. We can say not necessarily because the saints, okay, can indicate the church or the Jewish remnant that is left or that's in the tribulation. Here we see the reference of Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 13, 7. Okay, so when we're looking at predictive prophecy we need to compare scripture with scripture and put it into context okay right so here in verse 23 to 27 as we finish off here the meaning of the conspicuous horn and its defeat thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are the ten kings who shall rise from the kingdom, and another shall rise from them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall Persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. And then the saints shall be given into the hand of a time and times and a half a time. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is the everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Here we see this initial description of the fourth beast fits with the Roman Empire, in ancient history it does it, it did devour a whole civilized earth and dominated it completely for about a thousand years okay the tenth horn ten kings shall rise from the kingdoms these ten kings do not have a literal fulfillment in the Roman Empire historical account okay. if they are literal then they still have to materialize in the future. The only way to say this has been fulfilled is to spiritualize this prophecy and take away its plain sense. Okay, so there we go. And we're talking about what we discussed earlier on about the seven mandated dominion theology. Okay, so here we need to look at John Calvin. Okay, he merely spiritualizes this. He insists that what happened in this chapter was fulfilled in history up to the time of Jesus' first advent. And suppose that the ten horns merely represented a multiplicity of kings under the Roman emperor and believed that the conspicuous horn was Julius Caesar and the other Caesars who succeeded him. And for Calvin, the books were opened in verse 10, refers to the preaching of the gospel. So that's what Calvin adheres to. Not to say that Calvinists still believe that, 
But if there is, there are ten toes, Daniel chapter 2, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and ten horns in Daniel chapter 7, and Revelation 13 and 17, associated with the rule of this final world ruler, there is no good reason to spiritualize what God has said at last four different at least in at sorry in at least in four different places. Okay. So we can't just spiritualize one part of scripture in the prophetic sense. Because scripture, remember, is interlinked and we've got to compare scripture with scripture. Okay, so the same spiritualization problem applies if one believes that it is fulfilled in, early, in the early church and the passing of the Roman Empire. Okay. Okay, just like Calvin saw the fulfillment of this prophecy before the first advent of Christ. This conspicuous horn must be the Antichrist arising out of some group of ten nations that is some way part of a restored Roman Empire. Okay, if we shall speak Pompously words against, or pompous words against the Most High. The little horn spoke pompous, blasphemous words, perhaps like a fascist, fascist creed of Italy. Okay. Right. And then we need to also, shall persecute the saints in the Most High. We need to look at that. This speaks of the cruel and systematic pressure coming from the world to wear away or to wear out the saints. In reference to the friction that is Created when wearing clothes and shoes. That's the literal transliteration of the Hebrew. To wear out the saints means to harass them and continuously persecute them so they become, or life becomes, a wretched existence. That's what Wood said. So Archer here says also in this quote, such conditional and protracted pressure far more effectively breaks the human spirit than a single moment of a crisis that calls for a heroic decision. It's easier to die for the Lord than to live for him under constant harassment and strain and folks i think that archer the conditions of the world today as we see that christians are being marginalized more and more we are going to see this constant harassment and strain coming against us as christians the bible predicts a no peace loving world ruler for the last days. Okay. The conditions are ramping up for his rise. We can see that. We can expect nothing more than greedy commercialism and political imperialism under the most beastly and barbaric type of warfare. That's what Strauss quoted. Okay shall intend to change times and laws. The little horn will intend to change times and laws. Perhaps as the French revolutionists did when they radically wanted to institute a 10-day work week. 
in 1797, the year of the revolution, when they revolted against the monarchy in France, they wanted to start that in 1792 as year one. Okay, now we can kind of look at briefly here a statement. The seventh day as Adventists have historically taught that it was the papacy which changed the times and law by moving the Lord's day from a Saturday to a Sunday. Okay. So some traditional Seventh day Adventists therefore regard Sunday worship as a reign of Antichrist. So, once again, the Seventh-day Adventist guys need to read their Bible and see that we are living in the age of the Gentiles. Okay. When the saints shall be given into the hand a time and times and times and a half, the power of the little horn over the saints is limited. Okay. It will last for three and a half years. Time and times and a half a time. Okay. This phrase is used in Revelation 11, verse 2 and 3, 12, verse 6 and 13, verse 5, to refer to half of the last seven year period of man's rule on this earth which is the 70th week of Daniel and we'll be looking at that prophecy going forward they shall take away his dominion and consume and destroy it forever in the day of the persecution by this blasphemous ruler the Messiah will establish his kingdom for his people. Because the kingdom of Jesus immediately succeeds the fourth kingdom, no event in the past answers this prediction in the smallest degree. Certainly the church did not cause a sudden catastroph catastrophic fall of the Roman Empire. Okay. It is questionable whether the Roman Empire had any serious opposition from the Christian Church or that the growing power of the Church contributed to, the ma to a major way of its downfall. Okay. Okay. So, there are three opinions in interpreting, interpreting the kingdom's establishment here. There is no fulfillment in Daniel's in error. Okay. The fulfillment is symbolic in church history. Or the fulfillment is literal and yet in the future. And we kind of look at that bottom one futuristically. Okay, because the other two are null and void. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole earth shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. This has to describe the millennium, millennium, millennium period of the earth rule under Christ. Okay, not our current age or heaven. Okay. The kingdom and dominion of the earth certainly does not belong to the righteous right now. If it is, if this describes the eternal state, then that, then what are the dominions that shall serve and obey Christ. 
It therefore must describe the millennium period on earth. Okay, so we again notice that the kingdom and dominion shall be given to the saints. It is something received, not achieved. The church does not covet the, the world, okay, to Jesus, his kingdom, it, and give the kingdom to Jesus. He gives it to them. Okay, we discussed that earlier on. We made that point. Okay. Then the last verse, Daniel's troubled reaction to this vision and its interpretation. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Okay, many things might have troubled Daniel in this vision, such as the ferocity of the attack to come against his people from the cons um, conspicuous horn, and also his countenance changed. Daniel was convinced that the prophecy was true and that it was the word of God. He was so convinced that it's the truth that his countenance changed. He considered what would happen. And that brings us to the end of chapter 7, brothers and sisters in Christ. As we ponder this chapter, we need to understand that we need to also look at various other passages in the Bible that have connections to this predictive prophetic passage. And we're going to cover a couple more of Daniel's visions and I will be putting together a more detailed video in the next couple of weeks covering these visions. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I do pray that you will meditate on these things and remember that God is in control and that no matter what man may plot and plan, God will always direct his path. And also, as the psalmist says, why do the nations plot a vain thing against the Most High? Folks, man is just such an egotistical human being without the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. The way of living in the world is totally counterintuitive against the Christian way of living. And we can expect more and more marginaliz marginalization of Christians to come before we witness the end. Folks, I trust and believe that you enjoyed this teaching. Have a blessed week and don't forget, please, if you could subscribe to my channel, hit the like button and share my videos as much as you can just to get God's message and Christ's salvation out to as many as we can. We'll chat again and Daniel chapter 7.